Hello, Stan. I'm the chair of your talk. Can you connect? Can you share your screen? Connect with your talk. Can you hear me? Um, yep. Can you you can see my video as well? There you go. Yes, uh, yes, we can. Okay. So I'm can we start? Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. I'm just going to make it full screen. That should still work. Okay, very good. Okay, great. So I'm going to start now. Yes. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, and, sorry uh, to start the afternoon session. We are sorry we had a very small delay because of some technical problem. The door was not opening, but uh, now luckily we succeeded. Otherwise, the locksmiths would have come. <laughs> uh, but in any case, uh, I'm, uh, I'm very glad uh, and honored um, to uh, introduce the first speaker of the afternoon, Sean Majid, and uh, he will talk about uh, quantum gravity on uh, finite space time. So you have uh, 35 minutes plus five minutes uh, for discussion, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah. So quantum gravity is something that uh, people uh, have, has motivated a lot of people over the years. And uh, I just want to explain to you that I don't necessarily know the ultimate theory. It could be string theory, it could be whatever you like. But the starting point is, is that on its way to, it must in some limit give GR. And on its way, we could expect that it has some kind of correction to space time. And because it's a quantum time scale correction, you might expect that this would be non commutative coordinates. So this is the quantum space time hypothesis. Now, so that motivated the development of a kind of quantum geometry over the years. And so that's the formalism which I'll be using in this book with Beggs. And this doesn't discuss quantum gravity itself. It just discusses a generalization of Ramanian geometry, which allows the coordinates to be non-commutative. And it's uh, quite systematic, it's about 800 pages. And includes, in a particular case, uh, discrete geometry. It turns out that graphs are, are naturally non-commutative even though the coordinates are commutative, the differentials are not commutative. And then if, you, if we accept this, then it may be that quantum gravity itself, if you're going to write it as a function integral, then a better approximation would be to build that on the next approximation of space-time, which would be quantum space-time. So we're going to be doing um, sort of function integrals and gravity, um, quantum gravity, but on a space-time that's already been modified to make it non-commutative, because that's what we believe it should be anyway as a better approximation. So this is the plan of the talk. I'll explain the formalism. I'll explain, I'll do, I'll give you a model of quantum gravity on a square. I'll give you a model of quantum gravity on a polygon and quantum gravity on a fuzzy sphere. And then we'll have discussion. Um, just uh, mention that this paper here is uh, joint work with my, uh, with uh, Agota Quiroz. And this uh, is joint work with Lyra Torres. Um, okay. So um, if I haven't got much time, so I'm going to zoom through the formalism a little bit, but you can find uh, everything in, uh, in, in, in the book. So um, the idea is, is that you take replace the uh, functions on the manifold. You think of it as an algebra, a really degree zero part of an exterior algebra with different degrees. And uh, that's of course what we do in classical geometry. And the key thing there is a differential which increases degree by one. And you classically it would commute and it would obey the graded Leibniz rule. And then what we do in the quantum case is we let a omega zero, the algebra function be any algebra over a field K. And we drop the requirement of being a, a commutative or the exterior algebra being graded commutative. Uh, we particularly focus on the degree one part. Those are the one forms. So what's inherited from associativity is, is that it's a bimodule that you can associatively multiply a differential by a function. The map D goes from degree zero into degree one. And we expect that all the one forms can be built from, uh, from ADB. And for a connected manifold, this, that, that would be the kernel would be just the constant functions. And then we would extend this to all the exterior algebras. Uh, all differential forms by taking the degree one forms and then having some skewed relations expressed in some ideal i. So it's a little bit formal, but this algebraic way just encodes the exterior algebra on a manifold. So that's what we mean by differential calculus uh, on an algebra. It means it's exterior algebra. Now, the next layer of this constructive approach to quantum geometry is the metric. Now, you normally think of a metric as something like this on the right in, in a in brown, uh, but this G mu nu actually had lives in one in, in in one point in space, 
which is shared between the two tensor factors. So really it's an element, G is really an element of omega one tensor over the algebra A omega one. So mathematically that's what it is. The inverse metric is sends a pair of one forms into a function. So this is a bracket and, and they're inverse to each other according to this. Now you read these diagrams going down the page. It's kind of fashionable thing to do. Uh, but this just says that this, the, the round bracket and G are inverse to each other. Um, one corollary is that you get constraints on the metric that should be central. So you could consider more general frameworks where that isn't required. We won't do that in this talk. Uh, now a connection um, should then be, normally it's connection is think of it as, as assigning to every vector field, a linear operator, but we will, we will leave the vector field um, unspecified. So really Nabla has output in omega one here, where this omega one, the first copy is waiting to evaluate against a vector field. And then the usual properties of covariant derivative then translate into properties of Nabla, which are written here. The first line is the obvious one, it's the Leibniz rule. But because, because um, you can multiply differentials from the left or the right, we also want to have a right-handed Leibniz rule. And for that to make sense, we need to have some map to flip the, um, to flip the output of Nabla. Of, um, you see all the outputs here have to be on the left, but, um, the thing which you want to evaluate against needs to be on the left. So you need some kind of flip map to make things consistent. Let's not worry about that. But um, sorry, connections that admit those things are called uh, uh, bimodule connections. Now, once you've got a bimodule connection, it extends the tensor products because um, we can apply it to one factor, apply it to the other factor, and we can use this flip to put the output of Nabla to the far left, where it would evaluate against the vector field on the far left. So in diagrammatic terms, this is what Nabla on a, ten on a two tensor would be. And so that now makes sense. So metric compatibility is that Nabla G should be zero. So this is a very natural framework. We haven't really assumed it. We just assume the bare minimum that any approach to non-commutative geometry really should entail one way or another. It may not entail it in an obvious way, but it should be buried in there. Um, the quantum Levitivita connection should be one that is torsion free and metric compatible. So this is the torsion tensor. It's think of it abstractly like this as a map. And then you've got the curvature abstractly as a map. So the curvature looks like this. It's got basically it's Nabla squared reading down the page. So it has output in omega two tensor omega one. So normally when you write a curvature, you've got the first two indices are, two, are really a two form index uh, or rather they're anti-symmetric vector fields which are to be paired against the two form. Um, now the Ricci tensor is the thing we need for physics. And um, so here we have a, like a working definition and not necessarily the ultimate definition. We just copy the approach in physics with a Riemann tensor. We have to lift the omega two to an element of omega one tensor omega one. So that now the output lives in omega one tensor omega one tensor omega one, and then we can take a trace. Uh, so now this lifting map is something you take for granted in classical geometry. It just sends a two form into an anti-symmetric pair of one forms or a sum of anti-symmetric pairs of one forms. Um, which is how you might even think of a two form anyway. Um, so, and in our examples, it will also be anti symmetrization because our examples will be fairly close to the, uh, we'll take the Grassmann algebra for omega for higher exterior algebra. Now, the, once you've got the Ricci tensor, um, then you just contract it further with the round bracket metric to get the Ricci scalar. And that's an element of the algebra. So the great thing is, so this is like a formalism of general relativity, but the whole thing works over any associative algebra equipped with a bimodule differentials. Um, so that's the formalism. Now I do want to spend most of my 35 minutes on the example. Um, so, so sorry for that, was a little bit quick. So now our example, first one example is going to be quantum gravity on a square. So um, I'm just, just for, you don't have to, but just for convenience, I'm going to identify the four vertices of a square as coordinates in Z2 cross Z2. So this is like zero, zero in the group Z2 cross Z2. But these are my, they're, just, they're just a way of labeling my vertices. In the same ways, it's useful to have the group structure of, R, of Rn, uh, even though it's, a lot of things don't depend on that. Um, now, the calculus on a discrete set, this really just functions on a set of four points. Um, so the calculus on any discrete set corresponds to a graph. That's uh, a mathematical fact. Um, omega one corresponds to graphs. These, so here our graph, I'm gonna specify that. So specifying the calculus means specifying a graph between the four points. So I'm gonna specify a square. So that's my graph. And 
the, the one forms are literally spanned by the arrows, by the vector, by a vector space whose basis are given by a label by the arrows in each direction. So there are two arrows here, two arrows here, et cetera. There are eight arrows. Uh, but it's quite convenient to organize them into things which are Z2 cross Z2 translation invariant, just like on a lead group, it's useful to work with the less invariant basis of one forms. So, we'll, so there is a basis of one forms, which are E1 and E2. And um, uh, so there's two of them, which times the function on the algebra gives you eight. So there are eight, eight uh, one forms. Um, the, and they just cross one algebra with DEA zero. Now, once you specify the calculus, all of the rest is really not for us to specify. We should do nothing ad hoc, right? We should pick a formalism, uh, preferably a general one, and then we should just see where the form, what the formalism gives us and do nothing by, in an ad hoc manner. So we'll try to do that. So you analyze what are all the possible metrics. And they're basically got to be, for reasons that I touched upon of the centrality, they're forced to be of this form where A and B are arbitrary functions. So they're no off diagonal allowed in this, in this basis. Um, but we will impose one physical condition. Um, at the moment, the, a metric really corresponds on a graph, really corresponds to real numbers on the edges. I call them square length. So there are eight real numbers, one for every arrow. Uh, but obviously, if for physical reasons, you would expect the distance to go from A to B to be the same distance from B to A. So that's not required in the mathematics, but we impose that as a physical condition. So that puts a limit on these functions, and that's these, this here. This, is, this means the differential in the one direction. Um, uh, so A11 is the same as A01. So the differential in the first coordinate is zero. And uh, similarly for B. So really I've just got four, I've just got, uh, these numbers are the same. These numbers are the same, I've just got four real numbers now. And now you solve for the Levitivita connection. There isn't a theorem, but in this case, that of a unique one or even of existence. So you have to solve it by hand. But here we find a one parameter moduli of them labeled by a, a modulus one parameter. Uh, it doesn't really matter too much for this talk, what this looks like, but there's a certain construction which we use. It's basically, we, we work backwards and construct the sigma, um, uh, which turns out to be, we, class, we, uh, you know, we classify all possible solutions of those equations by, for, by making, uh, by looking at possible, possible sigma and then we recover nabla from sigma and this particular one form. Okay, so it doesn't matter how we get that. This is its curvature. So the curvature sends a one form into uh, omega two tensor, omega one. So the volume form here is just E1, E2. Um, that's the top degree form uh, in degree two. Uh, and um, so this is the curvature, first component, second component, and similarly for nabla E2. Then we take the Ricci scale, the Ricci tensor, and then we contract it and get the Ricci scalar. This is what we get, where um, chi is just this function here. So these A's and B's and alphas, they're just built from the metric data. So that when we organize the metric um, into uh, a, a zero, these are the, a, the A's are really the, the data. Um, well, the A's, the, the, the um, there are two A's, two values of A here and two values of B here. So the A's and B's are the, are the metric. I've just organized them. So the A zeros and the A's are the lengths here. The B's are the lengths on the vertical edges. And I've just made functions alpha and beta from them. Um, so that gives you the, the Ricci, the Ricci uh, scalar. Then Einstein Hilbert action is to integrate over the manifold. So we, here it's a sum. We need a measure and the one which gives nice answers. And so this is, this is where a little bit state of the art comes in. We have to do to think, choose our measure, but we choose it to be guided by you know, what, what's, what gives a reason, reasonably uh, good answer. And so that's the choice of the measure. Uh, you might think it should be a half, but you see dimensions all get screwed up in, in, because it's really, it's got, it's the discrete, it's got zero dimensions, a set of points, but it's got two dimensions as a tangent space. So usual notions like you should put a half here don't necessarily apply. So what works uh, is, is this, uh, is that choice and that gives you this. So this expresses the uh, sort of energy in the gravitational field. And indeed, if you, if you try to minimize it, it's get minimized on the constants. Okay, the, um, the, next, um, the next thing I want to do is I want to Fourier transform into field space. Um, the, the, uh, into, into, into a field momentum space. So that's just a Fourier transform on Z2. So the, the, the field A's and the B's, they live over um, on, on my, my set of four points. I can do it's Fourier transform. 
and there are two there are there are four plane waves there's a constant wave there's the wave with momentum in the in the i direction on trivial momentum in the i direction a wave with much momentum in the j direction and then there's their product so this the momenta are zero 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 one one zero and one one uh, but when you but because of the edge symmetry condition which was had that physical reason um, when I write out the expansion of A's and B's in, in those bases, I don't see any of the phi's in A. I don't see any of the, of the psi's in, in, in B. So, that's, so this, is the expand, this is just the Fourier transform of the, of the metrics as functions on space-time to coefficients of the plane waves, i.e. the field momentum variables. Now, we do want to have one restriction. These A's and B's, they are the lengths, and they shouldn't change sign suddenly. So for the Euclidean case, they should both be, both be bigger than zero at every point on, on the manifold. So that, um, so that requires uh, a condition on, the, uh, on, on K1 and on L1. Uh, and so we fix the conventions by keeping K0 and L0 bigger than zero, and then K1 and K1 can be positive or negative, but they should be bounded like this. In the Minkowski case, I'm going to consider the horizontal edges as time-like, and I'm going to let them be negative. So then I'll write minus A in the same parameterization. The, um, and then the last thing I'm going to do is what seems to be nice for gravity is to look at relative things. So I'm going to treat, I'm going to look at the fluctuations. So K1, right, is the amount that it, psi goes plus or minus one as you move. So K1 is the strength of the fluctuation, but I'm going to do it relative to the average value. K0 is the average value, right? And this is the constant function. So I'm going to do K is the relative fluctuation and L is the relative fluctuation of the Ls and they should now be less than one. Now we take the Einstein-Hilbert action that I had before, and in the momentum space, it looks like this. So if, 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 this was, if K was small, then this would, you could ignore the denominators, and you would just have K squared, which would just be a free particle on Z2, if you worked out what that was. Um, so it basically, it, it looks like a bit like a free particle, but there's a weird thing going on for larger field strengths in momentum space. Now I'm going to define this function alpha, um, and then I can write nice and help an action like that in terms of alpha. Um, now notice that it's that firstly you can here see here the where the minimum is. The minimum uh, is when L and K are zero. This is this is the, what I call the bathtub uh, potential, and um, as you can see from that picture. Now also notice that these are very symmetrical. So the K theory and the L theory are really the same, just if I buy a sign, minus sign. So now we'll look at quantum gravity. The partition function is to integrate over all the Ks, the K zeros, the Ls, and, and the L zero. But because of the symmetry, it's really the modular square of just one of those theories. So I'm going to define Z as the quantum gravity theory where we just look at the K modes. So it's integral dK, integral K zero, um, those are the in the momentum, momentum field variables. And then I change the measure from the A measure to this, I, get, I, I will get this. The, um, the, and this. And this was the action I had. This was the einstein hilbert action, half of it. And because of the, the minus sign, uh, the other half comes with a minus sign, it really is the, com is the complex conjugate because of the I. Uh, G is the gravitational coupling constant. I write now, this is, this is, this is divergent. Uh, even on, on quantum gravity on four points, uh, but I'm going to bound it by L here. And then, and then, uh, then it, it is, that controls the IR divergence. And then um, for fixed L, I can do this, I can rewrite this integral in terms of change variables from K to alpha. Um, so now alpha is my new variable. And then I can write this as D alpha. That's a trick which allows me to calculate the last integral. Um, this still diverges at alpha um, uh, approaches zero, but that isn't a problem for ratios. When you look at, even though this is divergent, when you look at excitation values, you're looking at the ratio of integral or something like this with some extra factors divided by Z. Which is, and then those both divergences are, into, are, both factors are divergent as alpha goes to zero, as, as the, um, but that's not a problem. The ratio is well-defined. Um, so, what you find is, is that these integrals, these ratios are well defined, and what you get is this uh, for 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 the k variable, for the k zero variable, and uh, that's it, uh, and k and zero when you have fluctuations. When you translate that back into the original original a zero, a one, etc., 
were the lengths on the edges. These are the two horizontal edges, A00 and A01. And um, so now we can look at expression values for a one edge for, for the metric and for the metric squared. And that means we can look at the variance. And so this is the first effect we find that there is, so we have a little baby toy quantum gravity theory. And here's just an example of a little calculation. Um, we find that the metric has a kind of uncertainty everywhere. And it's true for A01, we get the same number for A01, for the variance of 01, the variance of B00. So all the metric modes have a constant uncertainty. Okay, so that, that is quantum gravity on a square. Now we are in a curious situation where we can make these models. So we are in the kind of era of, if you, if you accept the formalism, we're in the era of quantum gravity model building of toy models. Um, but the weird thing is we don't really know what questions to ask. We've struggled for so long to find quantum gravity. We didn't really stop to think what we'd like to know if we got there. And so that's part of uh, what we're trying to explore. Okay, so I want to show you the next model. The, this is um, uh, Z, oh no, I haven't quite finished. The, even for this one, I would, there's another thing you could do, which is to look at relative fluctuations. So um, if you were interested, you could regard, here we intuited over all, all um, the, the divergence in L really can be traced back to the fact that we're intuiting over all scales. But if we were to put a scale in by regarding K0 and L0 as, as, as coupling constants and not do the K0, L0 integral. So this, so this Z is halfway towards quantum gravity. We just have to still have to do the K0, L0 integral. But, but now we can just focus on this, which is, the, which is the theory of fluctuations in relative to the K0 and L0. So if you fix the average value of the, of the metric in the horizontal and vertical directions, that's the theory we're doing. And that theory um, doesn't have those divergences that we had before coming from uh, the scaling of the metric. Um, so, uh, and you can just, and you can work them out. And what you find, I plotted the result for K squared here, which is like the propagator. And for, 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 large, for large K zero, like large scales or small G, it's equivalent, um, we are over here somewhere. And the real part then is much smaller and really it's something imaginary. What you've got is, is I times this. And that is what you get exactly for a scalar field, uh, a, a scalar field in this theory, if you were to do that. Um, so it behaves like a scalar field at large distances, um, but for small distances in the other extreme, instead of being imaginary, it actually becomes real. The imaginary part goes to zero and we get a, a fixed value of a third for, uh, for, this, for this guy. As G, as, G, as G goes to infinity or K zero goes to zero. And then if you look at these things, we have a similar constant value. So this, this uh, part, this approach of looking at fluctuation that actually captures a lot of the physics as well. Um, and that's a good, a good lesson to learn. So those are my two lessons from this toy model. I'm going to zip through the ZN model. Um, so here we're just going to see what we can learn if we replace um, the four points by a polygon of n points. So the algebra is just functions on, on n points. The graph is the n-gon graph. And because we'll make use of the group, we'll put a group structure on it just for convenience. And that allows us to write down a left invariant basis, uh, e plus and e minus. Uh, and then they have these commutation relations, functions and e plus e minus, they, they change by, by shifting, r plus or minus is a shift in the plus or minus direction. This is what r plus minus does. And the partial derivative is given by the, the partial derivatives in the plus or minus directions. The gross algebra for the exterior algebra. That's, that's all the input. Once we fix the input, we just analyze what are all the Hussle metrics, what are the connections, et cetera. So the metrics have to have this form. Uh, and edge symmetry imposes, tells us that there's only one function, which is A. Which is, and A is just the values of the lengths on the edges. So there's, A has, has N values, which are the values of the lengths on the, on the N edges. That determines the metric. There is, a, there is a unique uh, a quantum levitivity connection in this context, at least when n is bigger than four. Um, and, um, and, and it turns out to depend only on this ratio. So this is a at the next site divided by the value of a. So the lengths, how much the lengths change as you go from the site i to the site i plus one, that's rho. And then, um, so that, it's like a derivative of the metric in some sense. And then s in derivative of rho. So that's the Ricci scalar. Now here's an interesting surprise. We integrate the Ricci scalar 
against a measure. And the measure we take is really the determinant of the metric. So we take A here. And, um, and then we'll get, uh, we, we get this. And that's really surprising. This, this depends only on rho, of course. This is just the discrete Laplacian. This is just rho of i plus one plus rho of i minus one minus two rho i. So this is a discrete Laplacian on a circle. And so what we get is exactly a scalar field on a circle, except for one key thing, which is what makes it gravity, which is that this rho is not complex valued. It's not even real valued. It's real bigger than zero valued. So that's the, because these were all positive lengths and this was a ratio of positive lengths. So let's just show you what quantum gravity looks like quickly. So the, the, the thing we have to decide again is what is the measure? Um, and so you, there are different approaches. You could say measure, you could take the measure to be DA0, DA1, DA2, et cetera. You might do that if you were thinking um, uh, in conventional terms. But here that this space of rows has a constraint. So they're positive numbers, but with a constraint to be one. That constraint manifold has its own natural metric. So what we did in this paper was we took that, the metric on that space as to determine its measure. So that's, we take root square the determinant of this metric. And so that gives you this measure of the rows. Um, so for n equals three, for example, this determinant looks like this. So our function integral uh, looks like integral d rho zero d rho one with this measure. Um, and then this is the Einstein-Hilbert action, which was the scalar field, if you want, except that rho is going from zero to infinity, not, not negative. And, and that's critical to get these answers. So uh, now for large G, what you find is very similar behavior to what we had before. The, the variance of the rows is, some, is constant independent of I. Um, so you get a uniform uncertainty in the metric. Uh, okay, so you can also do the relative theory. And what's quite fun to do here is not, is not to do the difference. You can do the difference, but what seems to be more natural is to look at the ratio. Uh, against the geometric mean. So if you like, we take the logarithm of our variables and then, and then apply the conventional formalism. Um, so in, in, in these terms, we, we look at the geometric mean of the AIs, and then we, um, and then we let B be, be the fluctuation relative to the, to the, to the mean in a multiplicative sense. Now they, they rely on this constrained manifold. So we take, we do, and the metric in terms of the Bs, the, the einstein hilbert action in terms of the Bs looks like this. So for example, for, and now we've taken the other philosophy of, of just the A zeros, uh, the DA zero, DA one, DA two, that's our measure. And, but then when you, when you look at this change of variables, we have this, and then we leave out the DA integral, which of course is the divergences. So the relative theory, you leave out the average value integral, and then we just got this theory. And then these are the two point functions in that theory. Um, so they become a sign in, in large M, in large M. So, okay, so these are, if you think about it, these are somewhat reasonable. The, um, the correlation functions uh, uh, are maximum when the two sites are next to each other or even on top of each other. And then they get maximum, they get smallest when you're furthest, when you're around the other side of the, of the polygon. And then obviously they get back to one because of the, of the of the um, cyclic nature. Okay, now my last example um, is, uh, I want to leave a little bit of time for discussion. So the last example is, um, and, and so as I mentioned that work on ZN, that was with, with uh, uh, Agata Kiroz, uh, my student in Cambridge, uh, in, uh, sorry, in Queen Mary, um, where that came from. Um, and, uh, um, this other work is with my student. Yes, someone want to say something? Yeah, you have five more minutes. Yeah, thank you. I will, that's fine. Um, is, is with uh, Lira Torres. So now the fuzzy sphere is just the angular momentum algebra. Uh, this is a quantization of a sphere that goes back to the 70s, um, but uh, with a with the quadratic Casimir relation. Uh, so the calculus is the new ingredient. And there's a, we, we, take, we choose a certain calculus, but that's a central basis. Uh, so they commute. And then we write the D looks like this. And then the commutation, their Grossman relations, and the D looks like this. So we work with that calculus. Then the metric in, the, is, in those terms is just given by a real symmetric matrix. 
And um, the quantum Lebesgue Vita connection exists as a unique one in, in under certain assumptions, which is given by these Christoffel symbols. Work out the curvature, work out the Ricci scalar, Ricci, Ricci tensor, Ricci scalar, and this is the answer. So in terms of the metric, the Ricci, Ricci um, scalar curvature is the trace of G squared minus a half trace of G squared divided by the determinant. So that's a nice simple answer. So that's gonna be the quantum gravity theory. So now we integrate overall. Now there's a measure in the, we have to integrate over the fuzzy sphere, but that just means you're finding integral of one. And because the, the einstein hilbert action doesn't have any coordinate dependence, uh, because the GIJs didn't have any coordinate dependence, uh, it just, we can just, just assign a number we like, and we'll just assign det G to be to, for the measure here of integration on the space side. Now we also have to have a measure on the space of metrics. And here, the space of three by three um, um, symmetric um, matrices, positive definite matrices is a symmetric space. It has a natural structure, has a natural metric on it um, with this measure, with this metric. So that gives you a measure for integration. So now the quantum gravity theory looks like this. We take the, that, that formula I told you for S on the previous slide and we integrate it with this measure. So this is the measure. Um, and this is the action. And now I'm, I'm going to do one thing to get, I'm going to let G be given in terms of Euler angles and the diagonal, the eigenvalues. And then, so in those terms, the measure here decomposes into angular part plus the spectral part. And then I'm, if I'm only interested in quantum gravity with, in observables that don't depend on the angles in spectral observables, then I can just work with this reduced quantum gravity theory where I just don't do the, or I, I leave out the d theta, d phi, d psi integrals. So that's this reduced theory. So that theory can then be calculated reasonably nicely. And, uh, and here's some answers. And I haven't got, I've run out of time, uh, I will run out of time. So let me just say that um, the, uh, the, we get a similar phenomena. The expectation of values can be computed. Here it's quite mathematical uh, and we have a kind of constant variance, okay. Um, so I've just got maybe three minutes just to say, just to wrap up. So there are a lot of, so what I want to tell you is, is that we do have quantum gravity models now, as opposed to matrix, uh, lattice calculations, these are not approximations. We're just taking the view that geometry is a non-commutative one and we're just looking at a finite non-commutative geometry. Um, so it's not considered as an approximation for anything, uh, but obviously you can have other models. We looked at black hole models with fuzzy R, uh, R2, uh, fuzzy spheres and discrete and, and polygons, et cetera. Um, you can, I think I haven't got time for quantum geodesics, but there's a whole theory of quantum geodesics. Let's just go straight to particle physics, given the audience here. Um, I just want to mention this because I mentioned the abstract. So Con has an idea to apply particle, uh, this kind of finite quantum geometries, like what we've been doing, to particle physics by tensoring space-time with a finite quantum geometry. And then in his approach, he, his approaches it through a Dirac operator, what he calls a spectral triple. There's a finite one on the finite manifold plus a standard one on the, on the, on the Minkowski space. And then he allows fluctuations of, of the, this is the direct sum of those two essentially. He allows fluctuations and these fluctuations within his axioms uh, encode the gauge fields and the Higgs field. And then he writes down what he calls the fermionic action and the spectral action. This contains the Higgs potential. And also if, if you do it over a closed space, this contains gravitational Einstein-Hilbert action. Um, okay, so that's his formalism. But now think about the reason I want to, what I want to end with is just the following question. When can d finite on one of these algebras actually be realized in terms of a quantum geometry the way we've done it? In other words, with a, a metric, a connection, um, et cetera. All of those things are buried inside. So not every Dirac algebra can be realized geometrically. That's an interesting question to which we have some answers in these papers. And then if you could, if you could realize it geometrically, what does that condition of geometric realizability imply for in this context? Because whatever you choose for D determines your particle spectrum uh, in, in Kahn's formalism. So we'll get constraints on, on the standard model particle physics from the geometry of this, of this finite part. And we get a better understanding of the geometry if we ask for it to be geometrically realizable. Okay, that's where I'll stop. Thank you. All right, so many thanks for your, for your nice talk. There's one question here. Sure. Thanks, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I have one question. So if I understood you correctly, in all the examples that you went through, in particular the one for the fuzzy sphere, 
the metric that you used was just so it was a three times three metrics of constants, right? That's right. And the reason for that was right back in the very innocent looking axiom here, um, which was that the metric has to be central. It's not an axiom, it's a consequence. So people say, why it to be central? Well, it doesn't, we didn't ask it to be central, but just requiring a, a, bi a metric and a bimodule inverse forces the metric to be central. And then in our example, for the metric to be central, because it's a central basis, if that is going to be central, then the coefficients have to be central as well. So if that's going to be central, then the coefficient have to be in the center, and the center of the fuzzy sphere is a constant. So yeah. that's the reason. Yeah, I understand. But of course, when you talk about gravity, you really want to have extra parametric. So is the formalism flexible enough to accommodate it somehow? Yeah, yeah. so you know, if you like, this is going to be like a, a principal sector of the theory, but there will be other fields, probably, which will, which, you know, you have to, my, my approach to this is to write down the formalism and then see what you get. And then we should think of it with the formalism, but we should do it in a systematic way. So at the moment, there isn't a systematic way to relax that bimodule condition, but you can ask for an inverse that's not a bimodule inverse, but then you can't contract things the way you're used to. You can't contract a two tensor to get a one to get, you know, a zero tensor if, it, if, it, if it's not a bimodule map. So something's going to have to go. So there's a kind of obstruction. So at the moment, the situation is a small amount of non-commutivity changes, kills, forces all those, those very modes that vary on the sphere in the metric to be killed. Uh, but it's a consequence of a small amount of non-commutativity, just as a, you know, just like existence of a single monopole changes, you know, if you go back many years, you know, it, it, it's just a con mathematical consequence. But I agree that we, we would hope that it, either, you know, it, it could be that in, in some deep quantum gravity limit of the theory where this exactly applies, um, it's really true that all those modes get, get killed, get pushed out by the non-commutativity. Or it could be that there's a more general formalism that we haven't yet found. Okay. Yeah, there's more questions. Call for audience. All right, so um, if you think of uh, class of gravity, you have a metric with a fixed signature. And uh, if, uh, if it, you allow it to fluctuate, you may imagine that uh, the signature may change. Now, yes. in your discrete approach, uh, you have imposed uh, the analog of having a fixed signature, I believe. Uh, the moment you said that your variable rho in the, the, two, the two model has to be positive. That's uh, right. So, uh, mm -hmm. think and, of, uh, re relaxing that or, or get it's, it's, it's a good question, but if you do relax that, then the theory behaves quite differently. It doesn't even resemble doesn't give results that I would say were convincing. Here it's nice, everything's real, you get these nice behavior. Um, so if you, uh, I, would, I would say it's worth exploring, but you have to explore it with care because it wouldn't want to just be wild. You would, you would, what you would like is something like, you know, a controlled transition. You wouldn't, um, and let me just say, yes, you, you should do that, but you want some way to have a, to, to force it to be, positive most of the time or something like that. Because you know, the real world does have uh, positive values. So you need to have some mechanism for breaking the symmetry. Um, so one possibility is in the discrete case, it's a very interesting question. In the discrete case, we actually impose it at this point. These, this, this, this Planckian bound on the momentum actually came from not changing the sign, um, even though this is also physically very natural. So it could be that when you, it could be that the signature will change when you go beyond the Planck scale, something like that. But you would have to be very. I, I, I would be very conservative in modeling those things. Uh, but certainly there is a scope for it to consider negative values um, uh, and and therefore negative signature on some. So what I did in this model was I just kept negative signature on in the horizontal direction uh, because I was modeling a Lorentzian manifold. But you could uh, you could definitely allow more generally. Um, relax those conditions you're much harder to solve and then you could then you have to invent some mechanism for having different phases of the theory one of which would be this one the Lorentzian phase but yes there is scope for that in the in the theory nothing mathematically nothing stopping you just calculational problems yeah, I think we have also uh, one or two questions from the zoom audience mm -hmm. um, the first question is by uh, Sashin Ryder Mm -hmm. yes. uh, can you add topological terms to your action? Uh, yes, I'm looking at the question. I just noticed that. Uh, yes, you can uh, certainly, and um, um, the because 
you know, everything is very concrete, but the thing is you have to know, you have to think about how to model it. So let's say you want to churn Simon's action. You shouldn't just dive in and just write down some random formula. You should have something which is a convincing churn Simon's action from a mathematical point of view. And, um, and certainly uh, you can do that um, in the context of, of, of quantum group uh, gauge theory. So in, in chapter five of the big book with Beggs, uh, we do have a section on, on churn classes and things like that. So you can write down um, topological terms that do make sense. I don't think anyone's ever done that, but uh, I mean, of course there is one that's already known. So uh, quantum gravity in, three, in, in two plus one dimensions is a churn simons theory. Now you don't on, on classical space time, quantum churn simons theory on classical space time, but you might but uh, you might think that you should go back there and do it again on a quantum space time. And so that would be a great setting in which to do it, uh, but it hasn't been done. Okay. okay. Um, then there's a final question also in the chat by mm -hmm. Francesco, the top one, maybe yeah. the Jim, answer because we are running out of time. Okay. Um, do you think about possible? Um, yeah, that's okay. Uh, that that's a that's a wonderful idea. I haven't tried to do that, but uh, I I can tell you that we do, I do have a paper on quantum um, on the Hawking effect on the integer line. So we have that we have a line mm -hmm. with a metric which actually has curvature, and and then if there's a jump in the metric, uh, like a step function, produces Hawking radiation. Uh, and so, and we can certainly look at the quantum gravity theory of that and look for phase transitions and things like that. So I think that's another very good question. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been done, but. I think at this point we have to uh, stop and we thank uh, Sean again for his nice talk. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, therefore we move on to the thank next speaker. You. I think uh, next speaker is Isabel. So that's right. can try to share your screen now. Um, it looks like you've disabled the screen sharing, so I'm not being able to share my screen. Just or start second. my video. Please. Yeah, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, good. Now, now it should go. Okay, one sec. Okay. So let me... Okay, one second. Uh, okay. I think you should be seeing my screen right now. Okay. Yes, so let me just uh, then announce you properly. The next speaker is uh, Isabel Garcia Garcia from the KATP in Santa Barbara. And the title of the talk is a uh, bounce of uh, nothing. Uh, 25 minutes, please, plus five minutes for discussion. Okay. So first of all, uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak at this meeting. My talk is going to be uh, largely based on these two papers that I've written recently with my collaborators, Patrick Draper and Ben Liller, who are at UIUC. So before I get into that, uh, let me start with some of the motivation behind the topic of this talk. So obviously, one of the most fundamental aspects of any theory is the question of vacuum stability. Uh, the standard tool to study vacuum decay in quantum field theory has been the semi-classical formalism developed by Coleman and collaborators. And especially relevant for this talk will be the work of Coleman and the Lucia that includes uh, the effect of gravity in this discussion. However, in theories that feature extra dimensions uh, that are compactified, there can be additional instabilities that naively cannot be well described within uh, the Coleman de Lucha formalism. And the most famous example of this is the so-called uh, bubble of nothing. So this was discovered by Witten in, in 1982. And as we will discuss more uh, in a couple of minutes, this is a type of instability that quote unquote, uh, destroys the space time. So why should we pay attention uh, to these bubbles of nothing? Uh, so first of all, as you all know here, extra dimensions are a common ingredient in many extensions of the standard model, including a string theory. So this immediately raises the question of whether our own universe could decay, could be unstable uh, to decay into one of these bubbles. 
the metastability of the sitter space. So the question of whether uh, the sitter exists uh, within a full gravitational UV completion, as you have heard, is not a completely settled question, but what is largely uncontroversial is that if the sitter exists, then it will likely only be metastable. So in a theory with extra dimensions, uh, is it possible for a four dimensional the sitter vacuum to decay into a bubble of nothing? More generally, uh, if bubbles of nothing are indeed a generic instability of theories with four-dimensional Minkowski or the sitter vacua, then this decay channel could play a very important role in the physics of vacuum selection, as for instance, would be relevant in the context of the string landscape. So in this talk, I am going to focus on identifying what are some of the necessary conditions for bubbles of nothing to be possible in, in realistic models. So specifically, I will be focusing on extra dimensions that are stabilized. So I will assume that there is a stabilizing potential for the modulus and that that potential is stabilized at a positive value of the, of the vacuum energy. So in particular, I will discuss how to include a potential for the radian when analyzing this class of instabilities uh, and what the conditions are on that potential for, for bubbles of nothing to exist. I will explain how uh, the relevant instanton in these cases can be described as an intermediate object between Witten's bubble and the more familiar bounds of Coleman and the Lucia. And finally, I'll discuss uh, the effect of a stabilizing potential crucially on the decay rate of this instability. And I will pay special attention uh, to what happens in the limit where the four dimensional CC uh, becomes, becomes very tiny. So people have found a uh, bubble of nothing solutions in the context of flux compactifications in, in six dimensions before. So in this sense, these papers provide an example proof that bubbles of nothing can be compatible with stabilized modulus. Um, our focus on these papers uh, is complementary to this approach in that we are not interested in finding or constructing uh, bubble solutions in specific constructions, but rather trying to assess how generic uh, these solutions are, and especially um, on studying the, the effect of the potential on the, on the decay rate. Okay, so let me start with a very brief review of uh, vacuum decay in quantum field theory and also Witten's bubble. Um, as you all know here, the semi-classical treatment of quantum tunneling is centered on finding the so-called bound solution. So this is the non-trivial solution to the Euclidean equations of motions that asymptotes to the false vacuum uh, and that has a single negative eigenvalue. In the absence of gravity, it is possible to show that the bound solution is O4 symmetric. So it only depends on the O4 symmetric combination of the Euclidean coordinates. And our job therefore is to solve the equations of motion together uh, with the boundary conditions, which are that the solution asymptotes to the false vacuum and if we want a non-singular solution, that the first derivative at the center of the bounds uh, is zero. The Euclidean action of the bounds uh, tells us about the decay rate of the false vacuum. In particular, it directly gives us the corresponding tunneling exponent. Moreover, the analytic continuation back into a Lorentzian spacetime gives us both the initial boundary condition for the nucleation of bubbles of true vacuum and also their subsequent evolution after, after nucleation. Including gravity, and this was done in this paper uh, by Coleman and De Lucia, requires uh, now treating the metric as a dynamical degree of freedom. Luckily, the offer symmetry of the bounds restricts our attention to four dimensional metrics that can be written uh, in this rather simple form. So the only additional degree of freedom is this scalar quantity rho that corresponds to the curvature radius of, of the unit three sphere. And itself rho is only a function of the O4 symmetric uh, Euclidean radial coordinate. So for a real scalar field that is minimally coupled to gravity, both the scalar and Einstein equations take uh, this rather simple form. Uh, so for example, the solution to these equations that corresponds to the, the sitter false vacuum is given by phi equals uh, its value in the false vacuum and rho, uh, the curvature radius of the three sphere again, uh, is just a sign in, this, in the CDL coordinates. And this little L here is just uh, refers to the size of the cosmological de Sitter horizon. 
So the changes that come from introducing gravity are on the one hand quantitative. So for example, uh, for the sitter to Minkowski decay uh, in the thin wall limit, the tunneling exponent now receives additional corrections uh, that are suppressed by appropriate powers of the Planck scale. But the changes can also be qualitative. So for example, uh, if the decay is from Minkowski to anti de Sitter, uh, there is a special value of the difference in energy densities between the two vacua for which the tunneling exponent uh, becomes infinite. So gravity is capable of stabilizing certain vacua that would be unstable in the, in the absence of gravity. So already the simplest example of a real scalar field that is minimally coupled to Einstein's gravity illustrates how gravity is an essential ingredient in, in any treatment of quantum tunneling. That the effects are not only quantitative, but that there can be also very important uh, qualitative surprises. And this is even more so in theories that contain extra dimensions. And probably uh, the most surprising example of this is uh, the bubble of nothing instability that was discovered by, by Witten. So Witten's bubble is an instability of the purely gravitational kaluza klein vacuum um, M4 crosses one. And I am going to refer uh, to the radius of this circle um, as capital R. So this vacuum has a non-perturbative instability and the relevant instanton is the five-dimensional uh, Euclidean Schwarzschild solution, which is given by, by this metric. So notice that uh, the Schwarzschild radius is the same as the asymptotic value of the radius of the fifth dimension. This is necessary for the solution to be a smooth. Um, and for Euclidean black holes, um, the, the Schwarzschild coordinate, little r, uh, only spans the range going from capital R um, out to infinity. So unlike their Lorentzian counterparts, uh, Euclidean black holes have neither an interior region nor a singularity. So in the near horizon region, uh, it is uh, convenient to define a new radial coordinate and a new angular coordinate in this way. And this allows us to write the five-dimensional Schwarzschild metric in this form. So we have an R2 factor, uh, as well as a three-sphere with curvature radius uh, capital R. So the 5D uh, Euclidean Schwarzschild geometry is completely smooth, okay? So asymptotically for large uh, radial coordinate, it looks very much like the false vacuum, so the cylinder uh, that I was showing in the, in the previous slide. And then in this near horizon region, it has this characteristic uh, cigar-like shape. Okay, so I've told you about the instanton that describes the decay of the kaluza klein vacuum, but I haven't told you about uh, what that vacuum actually decays into. So as usual, the way to find this out is by analytically continuing our Euclidean solution back into Lorentzian signature. And in the coordinates we're working with, uh, this is done by rotating one of the angular variables into the complex plane. So this gives us the space time to which the KK vacuum decay. So what is this uh, space time? So again, asymptotically after um, a coordinate redefinition, it is trivial to see that this is precisely the same as the original uh, KK vacuum. However, unlike the original vacuum, this new spacetime only exists for values of the, uh, of the Schwarzschild radius coordinate that are larger uh, than the Euclidean Schwarzschild radius, okay? So this new spacetime looks very much like the original false vacuum spacetime, except that uh, a hole or a bubble has appeared inside of which uh, the spacetime no longer exists. Therefore, uh, this name of, of bubble of nothing for this, for this type of instability. So initially, the radius of this bubble is the same as the radius of the extra dimension in the false vacuum. And later, it expands uh, with a speed that asymptotes uh, to the speed of light. So in that respect, uh, that is similar to the expansion of bubbles of true vacuum in the familiar uh, coleman de Lucha process. The tunneling exponent for the decay rate into a bubble of nothing is just the Euclidean action of the 5D Schwarzschild solution, uh, which is given by this expression. And indeed, uh, this is much bigger than one, provided that the size of the extra dimension is much bigger than uh, the Planck length, uh, therefore justifying 
uh, a semi-classical treatment of these instabilities. So uh, the purely gravitational uh, Kaluza claim vacuum is indeed a solution to the five dimension Einstein's equations for any value of the radius of the, of the fifth dimension. In other words, uh, the size of this circle is not stabilized. And it is in this context that Witten's instability can lead uh, to the decay of this of these false vacuum. However, in reality, uh, we know that any compact dimension must be stabilized. So in the rest of this talk, I am going to discuss what is the effect of stabilizing potential on this class of instabilities, both in terms of their existence and also the effect on the, on the decay rate. So first of all, uh, it is useful to realize that Witten's bubble can be written as the solution to a somewhat unusual uh, four dimensional Coleman de Lucia problem. And this was first pointed out a few years ago by uh, Michael Dine and collaborators. So as most of you know, uh, if we dimensionally reduce uh, GR in, in five dimensions, we can write it in terms of a real scalar field, uh, minimally coupled to gravity in to four dimensional Einstein gravity. So the relevant uh, four dimensional degrees of freedom here are going to be uh, the four dimensional metric as well as the radian field that sets the size of the extra dimension. And it was noted in this paper that Witten's bubble can be written as a solution to the four dimensional Coleman de Lucha equations with a vanishing potential for, for a scalar field. So, the O4 symmetric uh, Coleman de Lucia coordinate, actually, is related to the, to the Schwarzschild radial coordinate formally uh, through this expression. Notice in particular that the center of the bounds at xi equals zero corresponds to R equals capital R, which is precisely the tip of that uh, bubble of nothing geometry. So of course, this is not quite a solution to a traditional Coleman de Lucha problem, but rather uh, one where the bound solution uh, looks singular. So these two pictures show uh, the bound solution for the scalar field uh, here on the left and the metric degree of freedom uh, that correspond to the bubble of nothing. So here um, I am writing down their analytic expressions in the limit of a small chi. So near the center of the bounds. So this bounds is singular at xi equals zero, both the four dimensional rich scalar as well as the first derivative of the scalar field diverge as we approach uh, the center of the bounds. Crucially though, uh, the combination that enters into the Euclidean action for these bounds is such that all divergent pieces cancel and the final answer is uh, obviously finite. And indeed, uh, the four dimensional calculation of the tunneling exponent obviously reproduces the results uh, that I showed you earlier uh, than in the full uh, 5D theory. The value of writing Witten's bubble, however, as the solution to a, to a four-dimensional Coleman de Lucha problem is that this now makes it easy for us to turn on a potential for the scalar field and see how that changes uh, these solutions as well as the action of the corresponding instanton. So the qualitative form of the radium potential that we're going to have in mind for the rest of this talk is of this form. I am going to focus on a potential that has a local minimum at a value of the vacuum energy density that is non-negative. Uh, I'll take it to be positive and then we'll take the limit of vanishing CC at the end. So the potential around uh, this local minimum has is going to have the usual quadratic form and little m here refers to the mass of the radion in the, in the false vacuum. The behavior of the potential in the decompactification regime, so as phi goes to infinity, is not going to be important for this talk, uh, but it's well known that in theories with extra dimensions, uh, the vacuum energy density must vanish in the decompactification limit. So this is only meant as a cartoon here, but the reason uh, I am showing you this is that one of the implications of this behavior is that a local four-dimensional de Sitter vacuum will generally be unstable to decay into a theory that has vanishing vacuum energy and extra dimensions that are uh, no longer compactified. So this instability uh, goes by the name of uh, spontaneous decompactification and 
although it is not the topic of this talk, it will give us something to compare uh, the bubble of nothing instability to, in particular, the tunneling exponent, uh, which is given by this expression for very tiny values of the, of the false vacuum energy density um, is given by this, by this expression. And as you see here, uh, it diverges in the limit of, of vanishing CC as this, as this vacuum becomes Minkowski. What is going to be important to us in this talk is the behavior of the potential in the compactification regime. So in the limit that phi goes to uh, minus infinity and the size of the extra dimension, the size of the uh, KK circle shrinks to, to zero size. So this is what matters uh, to determine whether a bubble of nothing solutions survive or not in the presence of a stabilizing potential. And like what happens in the decompactification regime, uh, the behavior of the potential in the compactification direction is in principle uh, is not some universal property of theories uh, with extra dimensions. In principle, the way it behaves uh, will depend on the details of the, of the underlying uh, UV theory. So the very first question uh, we need to answer is what class of potentials for the radion are compatible with the existence of, of a bubble of nothing? So I am going to parameterize the behavior of the scalar potential in the compactification limit uh, in this way. So V0 here is just a constant that sets the overall scale of the potential. And this coefficient gamma appearing in the exponent, uh, in principle, may be positive or negative, OK? I'm not going to make any prior assumptions uh, regarding the sign, the sign of gamma. So if gamma is positive, as phi goes to minus infinity, the potential will go to zero. But if it is negative, then this expression will diverge in the, in the compactification regime. So if I now look at the uh, coleman de Luch equations with a potential for the scalar field, uh, and let me focus on the equation for phi, then this right-hand side for a potential that has this form uh, evaluated on the bubble of nothing solution is given by, by an expression like this, OK? On the other hand, uh, both terms on the left-hand side uh, grow as one over xi square near the center of the bounds. So if this uh, right-hand side either vanishes or at least diverges more slowly than the terms on the left-hand side, then we will know that at least solutions uh, with boundary conditions at the center of the bounds, like those of the bubble of nothing, are possible in the presence of a potential. And it turns out that this is true, provided that our exponential coefficient gamma is larger than the minus root six. Is so there, bubble, yeah. Is there a question? Um, there are five minutes left. Okay. Okay, so uh, bubble of nothing boundary conditions are always possible if gamma is positive. Uh, this should not be too surprising. Uh, remember, uh, when gamma is positive, the potential goes to zero in the compactification limit. Uh, so we might have guessed already that uh, this type of instabilities could survive in that case. But it is also possible for certain values of gamma that are negative, okay, up to minus root six in particular. And these negative values of gamma, as I said, correspond to potentials uh, that go to infinity in the, in the compactification limit, so curves like this. Okay. In fact, uh, the, the boundary conditions at the center of the bounds are a bit more general than those of uh, Witten's bubble. So to see this, uh, notice that there is not just one, but rather a one parameter family of a bubble of nothing solutions to the coleman de Luch equations in the absence of a potential for the scalar field. Uh, and I'm calling the, the relevant parameter here eta, which in principle can be any positive uh, real number. So, and for Witten's bubble, uh, we have been taking eta that corresponds to eta equals to one. In fact, uh, when the potential is strictly zero, uh, it is easy to show that the only effect of this uh, eta parameter is to rescale the full five dimensional metric by a constant uh, conformal factor. So the only thing we're doing in that case is changing the five dimensional Planck scale by an overall constant. So in fact, in the absence of a potential for the radion, uh, we can take eta to be one uh, without loss of generality. When there is a potential, however, uh, the bubble of nothing solution will only be uh, an approximate solution to the equations of motion in some finite region near the center of the bounds, okay? 
In this case, uh, the meaning of this additional parameter eta uh, becomes, uh, becomes physical. And the best way to see what it means is to look at the five dimensional metric near the center of the bounds. Uh, and we see that eta appears as a rescaling of the radius of the three sphere uh, of the near horizon geometry. So eta is parameterizing uh, a mismatch between the radius of uh, the bubble of nothing, which is given by the radius of the near horizon three sphere and the asymptotic radius of the Calusa Klein circle uh, in the false vacuum. Again, for Witten's bubble, uh, these two quantities are equal to each other, but in the presence of a potential for the radion, uh, the radius of the bubble of nothing needs to be self-consistently determined uh, when solving the equations of motion. So I'm now going to discuss briefly how to obtain an approximate analytic solution for this class of bounces. And to do that, I will need to make some simplifying assumptions. So first of all, we're going to be interested in the behavior of the decay rate in the, in the limit, as I said earlier, of vanishing vacuum energy uh, as the false vacuum becomes Minkowski. So I am always going to take the city radius to be the largest length scale in this, in this problem. And I will often ignore terms that vanish in the limit uh, that the city radius goes to, goes to infinity. I am also going to take uh, the mass of the radion to be parametrically below uh, the KK scale. Um, and we're going to, to use uh, the dimensionless product M times R as an expansion parameter to build, to build the bound solution. And finally, uh, I am going to take the overall scale of the radian potential to be smaller than, than this combination. So in particular, uh, much smaller than M Planck square uh, times the times the Calusa Klein uh, scale square. So, and this will just allow us to ignore the detailed features of how the potential looks like to the left of the, of the false vacuum. So I want to emphasize though, that none of these assumptions are necessary for the existence of these solutions. Uh, in fact, they are not even important for the qualitative features that I am going to discuss at the end, but they will make our life uh, a little easier, okay? And as usual, uh, with, when finding uh, analytic solutions, um, you can typically only do so under, under some assumptions uh, in some regions of parameter space. And I just want to emphasize that we do relax these assumptions uh, in, the, in the numerical analysis that we present in, in our second paper. Isabel? Yeah. Please wrap up now. Yeah, I, I think I can wrap up in, in about three minutes. Um, okay. Okay, so under these assumptions, uh, the bound solution remains very similar to the bubble of nothing, well into the regime of large rho, meaning uh, rho larger than the Calusa Klein radius. Uh, in this regime, uh, rho grows like uh, linearly with chi, and the solution for the scalar field as a function of rho is given by, by this expression. So assuming that eta uh, is not one, but a number close to one, and this assumption will be justified uh, in the next slide, then the solution remains very much like the bubble of nothing, um, um, very close to, until phi is very close to its value in the, in the false vacuum. Once in that regime, uh, we can actually just solve the equations of motion with the form of the potential that is appropriate for the false vacuum. And we can find the solution in terms of uh, Bessel functions. Okay, here C is just uh, an integration constant. So for values of rho much smaller than one over M, the solution looks uh, very much like um, the bubble of nothing like you would expect, but for rho much bigger uh, than one over M, this function just falls exponentially and phi asymptotes to its value in the, in the false vacuum. Similarly, as phi approaches its value in the false vacuum, uh, rho also transitions to the, to the familiar expression that is appropriate to, the, to match the, the deceited false vacuum. Demanding that the solution uh, remains continuous as it transitions from the bubble of nothing to the near false vacuum behavior allows us to obtain an analytic expression for the parameter eta that, as I said earlier, parameterizes the radius of the, of the bubble of nothing. And, Yes, analytically, this expression looks like this. Uh, this is what one of these solutions looks like. And this is a solution that has been obtained uh, numerically in the region uh, near the center of the bounds at xi equals zero, which is zoomed in in this square region here. The solution, again, looks very much like the traditional bubble of nothing. And then asymptotically, uh, the solution approaches uh, the familiar uh, behavior of the, of the, the Sitter false vacuum. 
Um, very quickly, uh, let me just uh, give you this snapshot. The way to obtain these solutions numerically is qualitatively very similar to the undershoot overshoot method that can be implemented for the Coleman and the Lucha bounces except that the singular behavior uh, of the bounds at the center uh, means that the appropriate initial condition for the suiting problem is not to start with zero velocity, but rather with infinite velocity, uh, and then a stop at rest at the false vacuum. You can ask me questions about this later on as I don't have a lot of time. Very last thing I'm going to mention in the last uh, minute I have. Um, so I've told you what these solutions look like. Now, let me just tell you the effect of the potential crucially uh, on the tunneling exponent. So there are two different types of contributions to the action of these instantons. Uh, one can be written as a sort of boundary term evaluated at the center of the bounds. Uh, and the second piece sort of takes care of the effect of the potential for the scalar field, uh, including the subtraction of the, of the De Sitter false vacuum action. You can evaluate uh, both terms under the assumptions that I've discussed earlier. And in total, uh, we can find an analytic expression for the action of these instantons. Uh, and it turns out it is a small correction on top of the bubble of nothing action, okay? And in doing this calculation, I emphasize I've sort of neglected all the contributions that vanish in the limit of, of vanishing CC. So there are corrections to this expression if I were to relax the assumptions I made earlier, uh, but what will not change, and this is something uh, that I want to emphasize, uh, especially strongly in this talk, is that all of the corrections to the bubble of nothing action uh, will be finite corrections uh, to the action. And this remains true even in the, in the limit of, of vanishing vacuum energy. And this is in a stark contrast with the other instability that is generally present when there is a four dimensional de Sitter vacuum, which is the case of a spontaneous decompactification. So if you remember in my earlier slide, uh, the tunneling exponent in this case is given by this expression. So this diverges in the limit of vanishing vacuum energy. So, so for sufficiently small values of the four dimensional CC, the K through a bubble of nothing type of instanton, uh, if it exists, it will always be faster than some of the other traditional Coleman de Lucha channels like a spontaneous decompactification. Okay, so this is my very uh, last slide. Uh, let me just finish with some conclusions. So I've argued that bubble of nothing instabilities can survive in the presence of a stabilizing potential for the radium. Um, and this can be true even if the potential grows in the, in the compactification limit, okay? Although as I've discussed here, there are limitations on how fast the potential can grow for these solutions to still exist. More important, uh, in the example that I've discussed, uh, the case of a, the Sitter false vacuum, the rate of decay into a bubble of nothing remains finite in the limit of vanishing vacuum energy, which means that for a small enough uh, cosmological content, it can become, it will become, if it is there, uh, the dominant decay channel. One of the most obvious implications of these results uh, in the context of, is in the context of vacuum selection, uh, for instance, um, if, I, if I compare uh, the bubble of nothing decay ray to the current Hubble volume, then demanding that uh, stability against a bubble of nothing could give us an upper bound on the size of, of extra dimension that is parametrically above, above the Planck scale. There are obviously uh, many open questions, um, implications for supersymmetry breaking. So I haven't discussed uh, supersymmetry breaking here. I've assumed supersymmetry is always broken. Um, there are, um, you know, there's been people who have thought about whether uh, in the same way that the universe could decay into one of these bubbles of nothing, could a universe like ours uh, come from the inverse process, nucleation of a universe from nothing? Uh, what does nothing really mean in a ubiquitous complete theory of quantum gravity? Uh, is it as bad as it sounds or is it just another phase of gravity uh, for which we don't have the appropriate degrees of freedom? So, what I've discussed here uh, and we discussed in these two papers has been in the context of a five dimensional toy model. Uh, there is much left to understand about the physics of bubbles of nothing, uh, both in general and in particular in the context of realistic models. Uh, but I hope I've convinced you that these instabilities could potentially play a very important role in our understanding of how the standard model fits into a full UV completion and that the implications um, can be profound. So thank you and uh, apologies for uh, running, running over time. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, nice and interesting talk. I think we have uh, maximum time for one short question. Okay.
Any question here from the uh, CoFO audience? I don't see any question. Is there any other question from the online audience? There's one question, no questions. So let me just have another quick look, but uh, I do not see any questions arising. So we thank you very much. Thank you. Isabel, for your nice talk. And uh, now we have a break, uh, a coffee break for 20 minutes.